Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we're going to be digging into how do we select the right NEMA low voltage motor. With us today we have a subject matter expert, Mr. Mike Rathman. How are you doing today, Mike? Good, Chris. How about you? Oh, just loving life, man. Loving life. Lo love digging through these motor topics with you. It's always fun. So, you know, when we hear NEMA and we hear low voltage, a lot of things come to, to, uh, to mind. So maybe just start, let's just start off by just defining what that is. What is NEMA? So um, NEMA is the organization that basically defines the processes and specifications associated with electrical apparatus. Um, in, in our discussion today, we're talking about motors. So um, the relationship between your motor OEMs and NEMA is an integral one. So as the um, governing authority being NEMA discovers and um, determines uh, new technologies and ways to improve upon efficiencies and, and wants to adopt design changes throughout the marketplace, NEMA will identify those in standards um, and then correlate that to the manufacturing operations for companies that manufacture motors, electrical starters, all those types of electrical apparatus. Okay. So I guess NEMA, they're also the group that defines, you know, what goes on a nameplate of a motor, correct? This is true. Um, NEMA does define the information that needs. Um, there's basically a minimum criteria of information that needs to appear on a, on a, on a motor that is specified as a NEMA rated motor. Um, quite often you see more than that on a nameplate. Um, the counterpart to NEMA would be the IEC governing body, which is more of an international um, body that um, even though is in play here in America, has its um, originations over in Europe. Right, right. Very good. Well, let's stick with NEMA for, for this episode and maybe unpack some of the important things to understand on a nameplate because you know I, I was on a in a meeting earlier today as a matter of fact and it came up as from a, a, a salesperson about you know what is the most important areas that sh we should understand about a nameplate because getting that right really makes sure that you, you understand what's going on with the motor and the design and that you're meeting the the criteria for the application so if you had to, if you could walk us through some of the, the critical areas when it comes to uh, the nameplate that you really can't skip to make sure you get the motor right. So I think there's some, some obvious um, information in there that probably most um, people in industrial maintenance or in, or in engineering are comfortable with um, that, you know, if I have to replace a given motor in an application um, that I need to match up. You know, and those are things such as um, what is the voltage rating of that motor? Obviously, we don't want to operate a 460 volt motor on a 2300 volt distribution system. Um, the speed of the motor, obviously, um, so that it matches the application. Um, the horsepower requirement so that we can deliver enough force to um, drive the application. Um, I think most people are comfortable with that. The next step on that, I think, would be the frame of the motor. And, and that's a NEMA frame designation. And uh, within um, that set of uh, letters and numbers that's quite wi widespread, it basically defines the footprint of the motor, you know, it's the physical characteristics of that motor, such as the the dimensions between bolt holes in the in the feet of the motor, the size of the shaft of the motor, the height of the shaft, those types of characteristics um, or design elements are defined in that frame. So obviously that's an important piece. Uh, we could replace a 460 volt, 50 horsepower, 1750 RPM motor with another one that has that same information. But if we don't match up that frame number, then it's probably not going to fit or it's probably not going to couple at the same height or the same orientation as an existing motor. So obviously that frame is, is pretty important. Um, I think a lot of people would get that um, and that's part of their consideration. 
but I think some some other areas that may not get as much attention but could have as great of impact on how well or how poorly a motor performs on a given application would be the enclosure type. Um, is it an ODP, an open drip proof, where there's the motor's actually open to the outside environment, could be exposed to whatever fluids or contaminant um, are present in the environment. Um, more commonly um, in an industrial environment, we would see a TE, excuse me, a TEFC motor, which is a totally enclosed fan cooled motor which gives you a higher level of protection from elements and whatever uh, may be in the atmosphere. So that enclosure is, is, is critical to mention. Obviously, you don't want to take a motor that is going to be exposed outdoors to significant elements with um, more of a traditional open indoor rating would probably not be a, a good suitable replacement. Um, I, I, another aspect I want to touch on that I think gets missed quite a bit um, in especially when we see RFQs come through where people are replacing existing motors, is the um, the NEMA design designation. And there, there's basically four designations for, for NEMA design, and that's design A, B, C, and D. And what they really speak to is the design of that motor and its capability to apply a general or a specific torque curve depending on what type of a load you have. So for an example, a design C motor, that its characteristics is that it has a lot of high starting tor torque. So the moment you push that start button, it's, drain it's generating a higher level of starting tor torque at a lower starting current. And this would be common for some for an application that's hard to get started, such as a reciprocating compressor, right? Um, a design A and a design B are more conventional for general use. Um, they typically have a, um, a, a more broad normal torque curve to it that it applies to a load with a moderate amount of starting current and a low percentage of slip. Slip may be a foreign term to some, somebody that's listening to this or not that familiar with the motor. Um, just to touch on that. Slip is basically the difference in the speed between the actual rotational speed of the rotor as compared to the rotational speed of the magnetic field in the motor that's generating the rotation. And there's always in, a, in an AC induction motor a certain amount. That rotor never quite catches up to the speed of the rotating magnetic field, but it can be, be, be varied through the design of how much slip allowance there is within that. And that impacts the, or applies to the type of the load as well. So just keep that in consideration. I think uh, this really impacted me at a one point in my career when I was working in the automotive industry, specifically in, in large stamping press designs where you have a motor that is spinning a very large flywheel. Think of a flywheel rotating on a large bearing that may be 50,000 pounds. Well, the way that motor needs to respond to that load to speed it up and slow down, obviously it has to be much different than if that was a pump that was just pumping water. So some attention to the design. Um, the design designation, whether that be A, B, C, or D, could have a significant impact on the reliability of that motor and its capability to perform with any given application. You know, there was one instance I'm thinking of an aggregate, and this happened in the past where, you know, typically most distributors or, you know, uh, motor houses, they're stocking that design B motor, you know. Um, and this was in a pinch and they had to get it going. They, they put it in, but it wouldn't start. And I believe this was on a crusher or either a bit, very big conveyor. But uh, it, it came down to, you know, it, it would not start because it needed that higher torque on the front end. And, uh, you know, that was a learning moment for sure. But it uh, goes to show you how important that NEMA design is. So it, very, very, 
very important factor there. And you also mentioned earlier, you said the term ODP. And I kind of want to talk on then why, what, what does environment, environment play in making the right decisions? When I, Cause I think about ODP, you think severe duty, you even hear these terms like IEEE 841. Maybe you can talk about the environment of a motor and these different terms, uh, how they apply and can be applied to to make sure you get the most run life. That's a great topic alone. I, I, I've even sat and been confused with myself. You see motors coming from a wide range of manufacturers in a wide range of places around this world. And there's all these different nomenclatures about, um, you know, it's, it's capability, it's um, severe duty, it's inverted duty, it's an 841, it's a totally enclosed fan cooled and there's a lot of different variances there and having a basic understanding of those as they probably apply to your environment more than anything I mean, is the direct correlation so if we look at starting um, in terms of of environment you know protection from the environment an odp motor which if you think of your you know your old big um steel frame large motors from yesteryear um, were the ODP design, where you you actually had openings in the in the casing that allowed cooling air or air to tr- to um, transmit through the motor to provide the the necessary cooling. The challenge with that ODP motor is obviously if, if it's open directly to the internals of the motor, then Anything in the atmosphere from moisture to dust to, um, you know, chemical contaminants can have a significant impact on, on the life of that motor. As we step up to a totally enclosed motor where we're generating um, cooling air through an internal means such as a, a fan that is mounted internally on the shaft of the motor, that offers us a greater degree of protection from the elements. That's more commonplace. I think you would you would find in some of your basic industrial and manufacturing environments. Step up there from the severe duty up to now. What's more common is the IEEE 841 motors, mm-hmm. and the big difference there really is the level of protection they provide to that to that motor to the outside atmosphere, and it could be things from the iron construction of the motor to um, the different types of seals that would be used around the shaft, the types of bearings that are utilized in that motor. So understanding if if uh, you're working in a paper mill replacing a motor, that consideration um, probably towards a severe duty or an IEEE 841 motor is more likely in that environment than if I was working in a pharmaceutical plant where everything's fairly clean and I could be fine with a conventional totally enclosed motor. Right, right. And Mike, just, just to, so we can clarify one thing, ODP, what does that stand for? I apologize. I missed that. Open <laughs> drip proof. Okay. Very good. I just... so that's, the, that's, that's the basics that it is an open frame um, and it's not designed to prevent, you know, foreign material from being forced into it. Um, but uh, basically it would prevent a, a dripping um, solution of water, whatever the case may be, from entering into the motor. Right. And, and to kind of to, to stay on that path, if a motor fails, should the users out there dig and try to understand why before they just replace it? Well, this speaks to a, you know, a common, some of our conversations around good reliability practices. I think what I see commonly in the field, and I know you've seen this, is, uh, you know, a motor fails in place for whatever reason. And there's an endless list of reasons why that could have occurred. But just to look at the nameplate for that motor and copy it, we don't necessarily know that when that motor had previously failed, it's possible that the exact motor that was needed for that application was not available in the storeroom. And they chose to use something close. It may not have had the level of protection um, some of these factors when they made that decision last time. Taking a moment to do a little due diligence with what went on here, why did this motor fail, 
can ultimately prevent you from stepping down the same road time after time. Right. Absolutely. And, and just to keep on this, what are some of the common mistakes that you've seen that people make when it comes to specifying the right NEMA low voltage motor? I think uh, one of the, what we've already discussed is, is the enclosure rating. Um, like I touched upon already, in a, in a heavy environment, um, you're going to be more aligned or, or more required to use a severe duty or an A41 motor. So uh, making sure that the, the enclosure rating suits the environment is, is definitely at the top of the list. Um, the, that design rating that we're matching the application, obviously, is the frame appropriate for the mounting requirements? Um, any of those factors associated with that nameplate that we've already touched upon would all be critical in ensuring the life cycle of that motor. Right, right. Well, Mike, as, as we kind of wrap this up here, you know, you have a, a ton of experience specifying motors, helping end users make sure they, they, they get the right motor for the application because so often that does not happen. Uh, and, and, you know, when you get that right, that, that right combination, run life goes up, reliability goes up, efficiency goes up, all those things. Are there any parting uh, words of wisdom or advice that you would give our listeners when it comes to selecting that right NEMA low voltage motor? I think one thing I'd add that, that I hadn't, or we hadn't touched on at this point in time is, um, you know, uh, taking into account if, if, if an application is used in a VFD as opposed to an across the line starter, <clears throat> starting with a motor that's vector rated or vector duty rated um, builds in reliability that, that, that applies directly to some of the um, bad characteristics that a VFD brings into a uh, motor life cycle. Um, and builds those characteristics into the motor from, from day one. Not to say that you can't operate a, a conventional AC induction motor on a VFD, but um, if, if the application is critical and you're not crazy about changing out motors in the middle of the night, ensuring that that uh, motor is a vector rated duty motor probably would pay off in the long run. Good, good point, Mike. We, we, we kind of skipped that point, but... You're right, because if it's not, it may not be able to dissipate that heat directly. So, so Mike, thank you so much. I mean, I think, you know, we, we went through a lot here on selecting the right NEMA low-voltage motor. There are a lot of factors to consider, uh, you know, but again, find that right partner out there. If you're listening to this, find the partner that you trust, that you can work with, that can help you source not just part numbers, but make sure you're sourcing the right information for your, for your application. And, Take it a, 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 a step further to ensure maximum reliability for your process. So, Mike, really enjoyed the time today, your expertise as always, and, and, and thank you again, sir. Hey, you're welcome. Thanks, thanks for your time, Chris. I appreciate it.